right, so good to see you. Um, I want you to think for a moment about one day. It's just some of the dreams that you have in your life for one day, some of the things you want to do. And it's, it's funny how those things come to pass. So for instance, some of you sat down and said, you know, one day we're going to buy a house. Do you remember those conversations? You were renting for a little while and then you thought, one day we're going to buy a house and we're going to own a house. And then you think to yourself, one day I'm going to sell this house and buy a better one. Because there's a progression that goes on. You think, one day we're going to have kids. When we got married, I told the first service this, when we got married, it was on the understanding that we wouldn't have children. So Julie was really clear. If you want to marry me, you need to understand, I do not want any children. Three or four hours after marriage, she was like, I have so changed my mind. <laughs> Spent a little bit of time with you and I realize, oh yeah. So we've got three children. So, but then you, so you think, so I'm going to have a house, I'm going to have kids, it's all going to be great. And then you start to think to yourself this, when are they leaving? At like, what point in the growing up are they going to actually, I'm not thinking that, I'm talking about other people. Okay, I'm, I'm not thinking that at all. And uh, you know, what point? Are they going to get on with their own lives instead of getting in the way of that? Well, I mean, people think some strange things. And then, you know, you think, like, I, I, this is the car. This is my dream car. Anybody ever bought the dream car? You, the car you always wanted. You bought it. Anybody? Any, yeah, one or two little hands. One or two, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you sold it. Because that's what happens. You have a dream. This is what you want. I'm going to get it. And, uh, and it comes. And it's one day. And then uh, it's gone. Oh, you know, you bought this item of clothing. You saved up for it. You bought it. And then in the end, the best you got out of it was via eBay. One day. One day. Imagine one day. You could do what that compassion video did. And have a moment where you get to look into the eyes of the person that you played an incredible part in transforming their life. One day, get to do that. One day, it won't just be a letter that you send, but an opportunity to spend an afternoon or an evening with them, an opportunity to spend a day with them. One day, we get those kind of chances. We love Compassion. It's great to have Justin, who is the CEO of Compassion, here with us today. I would make him stand, however, um, Justin, who is an uh, international gymnast for Scotland, has damaged his Achilles and had to have an operation on it. All of that is true apart from the international gymnast bit. <laughs> he is Scottish and he has damaged his Achilles and had to have an operation. But compassion is a key relationship for us as a local church. We love compassion. We love the opportunity that it gives us. And we love the bridge that compassion builds from our local church to local churches around the world. Uh, we're not just working with an orphanage somewhere. That's not what compassion is. It is children in homes being cared for in families, partnering with local church. And we love that. That's why it's such a key relationship for us. And you'll be aware, it's Compassion Sunday. This is the chance for us to really talk about what matters and why and how we connect all of these things together as audacious so that it works well for us. We're going to read the Bible together, so don't grab your Bible and don't put it on the screen yet. Don't do it. Because Paul gave me a heads up. They did it in the first service. We're going to do it. I'm going to set you off. You're all going to join in. You're all going to quote this Bible verse no problem. Are you ready? Okay, it's the 12 o'clock service, you're in Audacious Church, and we're vocal, aren't we? Oh, come on, aren't you at the back? Yeah, slightly less persuasive, but anyway, we're there. So, we're all going to quote this, are you ready? Okay, you ready? Why don't you stand up, let's make it a bit easy for you, just stretch your legs a little bit. You ready? Here you go, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Because when you settled down, you've got your sweets out, Chris Tool, and you've all settled in, you've kept your coffee under your seat, and you think now's the time, but just keep yourself going. You ready? After three. One, two, three. Our Father. Amazing. It is the most. You can stop now, because the, 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 it starts to drift away from the Bible about halfway through the bit that you learned, all right? So it's amazing. It's a Bible verse that you kind of sit there in your thinking, because probably at some point you learn it in school, or you learn it's this repetitious nature of it, and it sits there in our thinking. But have you ever thought about what it means? Grab your seats. 
We're going to be talking about it in life groups over this season, this term. Um, but we're going to talk about one specific element of it today. Because what it means is this. Our Father who is in heaven, how, it's interesting, isn't it? You drop into hallows and arts and those. Like you never use them in your normal life. And then suddenly you hear the words, our Father. And the next thing you know, hallowed suddenly comes out. When did you last say hallowed? Not hallo, hallowed in conversation. Hallowed be thy name. Then we say these words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God does not magically make earth like heaven. It's not a prayer that is praying, God, would you magically transform earth so it's like heaven? It's an impetus for you and I to play our part in making earth like heaven. The role of the local church is to transform society so that it looks and feels like heaven. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be. We are not called to live in the four walls of our building and hold on till God does his thing outside. We are called to transform society by the way we live so that it is changed by us taking who God is to society. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now the central part of heaven is the throne. Now this is not a particular wonderful throne. It's not a throne like the Bible describes, but it's a central part of heaven. When I was growing up and we talked about heaven, it, heaven, I found a little heaven a little, well, when we talked about it, we would say things like this. Heaven's like, just like this, this eternal time of worship. And I'll be honest with you, there was a little part of me that thought to himself, oh Lord, no. Like the idea of being in a worship meeting for eternity. That, some of you are nervously laughing and some of you are thinking, can you say that? I have just did. The, the idea that all we're going to do is sing forever. What song? I mean, who chooses the songs? Who writes the songs? What language are the songs in? Because tongues is not the language of heaven. You all know that, right? That's not like a secret heavenly language. It's not that. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. It's languages of the earth. Tongues. You learn something you never learn yourself. Tongue. So it's not that. And what style? Who chooses the style of heaven? Is it a different style every day? Is Mondays the Salvation Army's crack? I mean, is that what happens on a Monday in heaven? You know, you get up and the Sally Army band kicks in. It just, it's that that's going to happen. It's, you know, what's Tuesday? Gregorian chants. I mean, what do we... What do we have to work our way to? So there's always a bit of me. There was a little bit like, oh, Lord, mm, 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 I mean, I really like you, love you, but ooh, mm, singing forever? No, I've sat near me, Dad, and I don't want to go through that again. I, just what, what part of it? So uh, uh, the good news, heaven is about a lot more than the singing. But the throne, oh, the throne's really important. Because everything about heaven is orientated around God. Everything points to him and everything comes from him. So if earth is going to be like heaven, we've got to shape society so that everything points to God and everything comes from God. That's the role of the local church. That's what we're called to do. Let me read you what heaven's like. Revelation chapter 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. God is in the process of making everything new. Now we know about living in the old order of things. Because we live in this world. We know about the old order of things that says that some stuff goes really wrong, about sickness. We understand the old order of things. We understand the old order of pain, the difficulty. On Monday, I went to the funeral of a very, very close friend, 64 years of age. Painful to think about the journey we went on with that. Painful. 
God being there doesn't take away the pain. But as earth is being transformed to heaven, something starts to shift. Listen, God wants us to create a place called earth that reflects heaven. Where the old order is being changed because it is being made new. God says, behold, I make all things new. Do you ever look across our world and see some major discrepancies? Things that bother you. You walk through our city centre. Are you bothered by the people who've taken spice who are sitting and living in doorways? You read the stats about how challenging it is to be a single parent in society right now. You see some of the numbers about universal credit and the challenges that seem to be around that. And you look beyond the politics and see the people. You see what happens in our world, the disparity of wealth from one nation to another. The, the drawing of boundaries on a line has changed a nation's wealth by just a few miles and yet everything is different. And God says... You've got to change earth to be like heaven. You've got to challenge where there's trafficking. You've got to challenge where there is exploitation. You've got to challenge where any of the isms have got control of a situation. You've got to challenge those things. And actually, it's all about that. It's all about the throne. In Psalm 89, it says this, that God's throne is built on two things, righteousness and justice. They are the foundations of the throne of God. And if making earth like heaven means we've got to put God at the center, then you've got to get the foundations right for that. Righteousness is an interesting one because we have no power to make anything righteous. We by nature, we're broken people. You know it about yourself and you've met others. We connect with each other and we realize they're not perfect. There's no perfect person out there. And yet God, he makes us righteous. It's God who does the work that changes our lives through the death of Jesus on the cross. We are made righteous right with God. We can enter into that relationship with him so that we can enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise so that our worship is an offering that God is acceptable so that when we worship, God builds his throne in the midst of his people. See, we don't sing because we sing. It's not tradition that we sing at the beginning of a service. We sing because it is attractional to the presence of God. That God goes, when you worship and you give me your best, you build my throne and I come and inhabit the praises of his people. We're building a house for God. We haven't built him a house. We are building him a house every time we gather and we're saying, God, come and live in this. Come and be with us now. I want those moments in worship, I'm sure you do too, where I feel the presence of God in the room by the power of the Holy Spirit working and speaking. And I feel him right there tangibly moving in our midst. And that's a part of it. That's what righteousness does. It opens the door for us to be with God. But the foundation of his throne is not just one thing. You ever sat on a chair and it's a bit wobbly? You know, you're at a restaurant, you're on this chair and it kind of rocks slightly backwards and forwards or side to side. Or maybe you've come into church and you found that chair. We usually hide one somewhere in the middle. You know, it's not quite still welded together. And if you lean back, you're going to be in the next row. You ever sat on that chair? You think, you say, huh, what's going on here? Uh, Julie and I were at services a couple of years ago and in the middle of this big atrium as you walked into the services, um, there was these chairs, uh, this camping display. In the midst of it, there's these two camping chairs and Julie says, wouldn't it be funny if I just went and sat in that display? I said, yeah, go ahead, that'd be really funny. So she did and she went and sat in this display and the chair hadn't been put up right. So in the middle of this atrium, she jumps into this chair. The chair shoots back, was Julie, legs in the air. I took a few steps back so I wasn't associated and laughed my head off at this random woman fell over in the middle of it. It was brilliant. Have you ever done that? You see the change, it's not quite right. Can you imagine building God a wobbly throne? He takes care of the righteousness, but God doesn't do justice like a magic trick. That we should pray and we do pray, God, would you deal with some of these things in our world? But he asks us to play our part. 
You see, it is not God's hands that bring about justice on earth. It's yours and mine. We're the ones who've got to play our part to bring about justice where situations and circumstances have become unjust. Because I don't want to build God a wobbly throne. I want to build something that God with utter joy can sit on because his children have been made right with him and have pursued justice in a way that brings about real change. You see, as audacious church, we don't just proclaim the righteousness of God, the fact that he does that work. We do that every Sunday, you will hear us. And at the end of this service, we will give the opportunity for you to come into a relationship with God, to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if that's all we do, we miss a massive chunk of the very throne of God. We miss half the foundation. Because if all we do is pursue righteousness, we miss the fact that we've got to pursue justice. On Tuesday on The One Show, there was a clip of Martin Bashir. Just watch the screens for a moment. Sure. Now tell me, that, like, that's a lovely story about the church helping people out. It is. But the reality is they're really struggling. It is. I was reading a quote in a book recently that said, more people will attend a professional football match on a Saturday than attend an Anglican church on a Sunday. And certainly over the last 30 odd years, we've seen decline. Mm. But in churches where the worship is vibrant, where the preaching is relevant, you've seen an uptick in the number of people attending. In the Diocese of London, for example, numbers have actually gone up. They haven't gone down. And the Church of England... the Royal Wedding. Well, quite. And the, and the Church of England recently um, in, is investing something like £27 million in 100 new churches across the country, in coastal areas, market towns, and urban housing estates, because the church has decided that it has to revision itself for the 21st century. Right. So how else is it modernising itself, then, apart from kind of touting itself at kind of car boot sales <laughs> and dynamic <laughs> services and what have you? One of the things I think you have to remember is that one in five primary school children attends a Church of England school. There are 190 yeah, Church of England secondary schools. That means yeah. the Church of England is the biggest provider of education in this country. Mm -hmm. But I think what's happened, and also think about food banks. Vast numbers of food banks are run out of churches now. Mm -hmm. What we have is an institution that's realised it can no longer survive on the basis of singing, it's actually about serving. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're seeing things change. We're right next to All Souls Church. I know you always have, the one show always has, uh, a Christmas service there. Yeah. That church has an organisation called Tamar that works with the Metropolitan Police, a ministry and outreach to women who've been trafficked into the sex industry. They run another organisation called Aslan, which works with the homeless. These aren't religious in an overt sense, and yet they're serving people in real need in their communities. So it's about doing things rather than talking about doing things. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. there's a basic lack, isn't there, in institutions. MPs are not trusted. My business of journalism people are not trusted. The church isn't trusted. Mm. And so what's happening is when it comes to spirituality and faith, it feels like the argument is not being won with words but with actions. And there's a wonderful verse in the New Testament, and I'm going to quote it because I know, Matt, you love scripture. It <laughs> says this, Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify God in heaven. The idea is that action is what will lead to worship. And I think that's the significant change. And that's the future of organised religion in this country. Yeah. I think yeah. it is. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. BBC One, Tuesday night, that's the Bible. That's what we believe. We believe that it is our action that will cause people to move towards worship. That it is our serving of the city. That it is our seeing justice being brought about in all of those places where injustice is ruling. That is what brings transformation. Earlier in the year, we said it like this. We said this. Good deeds leads to goodwill, which leads to the good news. Uh, we're not just about preaching the good news of righteousness. 
we've got to have the good deeds. Church, we're not just about making sure we do the proclamation well on a Sunday. We're about every single step that we can take in order to bring transformation to our society. We're not just about gathering together and singing. Although we are about all of these things, we are also about making sure our actions reflect it with passion. We're a church that doesn't do social action. Social action is where a few people find something that they think they should make a difference about. We don't do that. We're not interested in social action. We're interested in justice. The opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Because money doesn't, doesn't change what happened. The opposite of food poverty for the children that we feed through the holidays is not there's more food in their cupboards. The opposite is justice. It is wrong. It is wrong that that occurs in our society. And as a church, we've got to get the bit between our teeth on the issue of justice. We have got to passionately pursue transformation and change, not just in our immediate vicinity, which we're doing and we're chasing after, not just in our city, which we're doing, and our nation, but we've got to see across the world the church playing its part is the answer to what our world needs. When we recognize what God's put in us, what He's equipped us with, the power that He's given us, then we can see we can play our part to do it. In the book of Amos in chapter 5, and don't mishear this scripture, but hear it clearly. God says to his people in verse 21, I hate and despise your festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I'll not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowships offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I'll not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice Roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. When we've only got half the foundation, we cannot build the church that God wants us to build. But when we dig deep on justice, ah, oh, what does that look like in your life? Micah 6 verse 8 tells us this. He has shown you, oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. What does God want from you? Act justly, love mercy, walk in humility with him. What does justice look like? Proverbs 31 verses 8 to 9 going to come up on the screens. It, it, it reads like this. It says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. It tells to speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Isaiah 58, reading from verse 6. Isaiah reads, well, This is the kind of fast day I'm after. To break the chains of injustice. To get rid of exploitation in the workplace. To free the oppressed and cancel debts. Keep going. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. If you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins. If you're generous with the hungry, start giving yourselves to the down and out. Your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will show you where to go. I'll give you full life in the emptiest of places, firm muscles, strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. And hear this next bit. You'll use the old rubble of your past lives to build a new. Rebuild the foundations from your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything restore all ruins, rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. In our borough, in our city, in our region, in our nation, our responsibility is to take hold of the power of the words of this book and let it make an impact in our lives. Amos' summary, let justice roll like rivers and righteousness like a never failing stream.
It is not one or the other. It is both of these things powerfully changing. Let me tell you what we do. Weekly, daily, we feed and clothe the hungry. Our teams are on the streets six nights a week, one night a week. We bring people into this building. We give them a three-course meal. They get clothes. Uh, they, get, they get toiletries. They can get a haircut. They get looked after and cared for. They get table service because they shouldn't queue for food. They should be looked after and honoured as you would expect to be looked after and honoured if you turned up to a restaurant. They don't do the washing up or pay for it in some subtle way. We care and look after them. We have given so far this year 6,000 lunches out to children who otherwise would get no food in the holidays. We are, we are teaching English for free to anyone who needs to learn it in order to better their position within our nation where English is the prime language. We are helping refugees resettle right across the country right now. Over 50 refugee families are now in the UK because of the part that we are playing as a local church. We are supporting hundreds and hundreds of cancer sufferers in our city who have been given a diagnosis of terminal cancer and once the Macmillan nurses have been in, the next people in are our teams, our volunteers who are turning up to drive them to appointments, to paint their bedrooms, to clean their houses, to buy them food. We're turning up in people's lives. We sponsor right now a thousand compassion children. As Audacious Church, we sponsor a thousand children through our partnership with Compassion. We are planning homes for the homeless, a school in every borough. We are planning children's homes. We are the agents of justice crawling through our city, changing lives one person at a time. And if that's all we do, it's great, but it's just a bandage. So we talk to local and national government because we need policy change and we need partnership, which means that the issues of justice that we're dealing with at the coal phase, we're also wrestling with in the big picture again, because justice can't roll like a river because we give out a few food parcels. Justice rolls like a river when our nation changes and food is easily, affordably available so that everything is different and everything is changed. Listen, if all we do is just preach the gospel, we have got to marry it with our actions so the whole Oh, John 10:10. 10, 10, we love it. It's life to the full. Life to the full. You need the gospel. You need the good news of Jesus. If you've never had an encounter with him that's changed your life, you've never had that moment, you've not got life to the full. But if you're living in food poverty, if you're living in a, in a sleeping bag, in a doorway, you equally have not got life to the full. And we have to do both. 